Thank you very much for coming out today on such a beautiful weather day. Um, this is a uh, one in a series of ongoing uh, public outreach meetings regarding City Place Burlington. Um, it, this, the format is very similar to last month. Um, you'll see a very similar slideshow. There'll be uh, some updates to the plans, a little more specificity on um, space and just a little more detail on the plans, but the, uh, uh, the content is very similar and the, the arrangement will be very similar. Um, our architect, Jesse Beck, will be doing a presentation supported by Kevin Warden, our civil engineer, um, and uh, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, so again, thank you very much for coming. couple of uh, housekeeping details. We have a sign-in sheet. We'd like everyone to use the sign-in sheet, put down your name, address, email. Uh, also, this presentation will be posted on the CETO website after today's presentation. And we do have an hour and a half scheduled. Uh, so after our presentation, we have a microphone in the center open for uh, any questions that you might have, and we'll address those questions as we go. So again, my name is Jesse Beck, architect with Freeman French Freeman. Uh, we've been working on the project for a few years now, and we're here about a month ago uh, rolling out the revised plans for our amended permits. So just to reorient people to the site, um, we have Pine Street with the new street grid going through the, the parcels with the area here which was demolished for City Place Burlington and the new Pine Street will be adjacent to uh, 67 Cherry which was the old Macy's building and that old Macy's building is being repurposed uh, for both office and retail in a two level structure. But today's focus really is about City Place Burlington and the redesign from uh, the prior plans. So I'm going to invite Kevin Warden up from Engineering Ventures to talk a little bit about the new streets, civil, and stormwater. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, much like the last time around, you can see here on the left. There's a new Pine Street connecting that leads from Bank to Cherry and uh, passes under 100 Bank Street. Uh, there's also a new St. Paul Street um, at the later points of the earlier <coughs> design. The south half of St. Paul was angled to better align with uh, the existing St. Paul and Bank Street intersection. Uh, mostly uh, from a streetscape, very much the same as before. The Great Street standards have been updated in the city of Burlington, so these plans now incorporate those standards. The main uh, significant change to point out is the access to the parking within the structure was previously on Bank Street and on Cherry Street. Those access points have now been moved to Pine Street. You can see the red arrows into the building and uh, St. Paul. I don't know, if, do we have a, a pointer? Yeah. All right, great. I think it's worth pointing out. So the uh, parking entrance is right here off of Pine Street, and the parking entrance is right here off of St. Paul. And <clears throat> just briefly, the stormwater uh, approach really hasn't changed either from the previous design. The site is essentially 100% covered with impervious, uh, with the exception of permeable pavers along the streetscapes. And uh, that will be treated in underground chambers to be retained and slowed down before being discharged to the city stormwater system and treated with underground sand filters. Uh, really a pretty remarkable amount of treatment, both required by the city and the state, to emulate flow from this site as though it were a meadow in good condition. So uh, much improved. And I'll also just point out that the, the, the pre-existing mall, about a third of that went to the combined stormwater sewer system, so it did contribute potentially to overflows, whereas the entire site will now go to the stormwater system. I think that's it. Thanks, Kevin. Yep. To uh, recap the program, 
in some of the program changes, uh, we've actually increased the number of housing units in this new plan and have 357 units of housing compared to the, the prior uh, number of 289, uh, 72 of which will be affordable and spread throughout the building. Instead of the South Building, South building being a commercial office building, it is now a 196 room hotel. We have reduced the second floor retail. In fact, we don't have second floor retail. We have ground level retail of, of 45,000 square feet around the perimeter of the building and oriented to the new streets, Cherry and Bank. Uh, like we pointed out, we're reconnecting the streets. In this parking structure, uh, we have 550 parking spaces and a total of long-term and short-term uh, bike parking of 297. The total gross square feet has been reduced approximately 25% from a little over a million square feet down to 763,000 square feet. And uh, the next few slides will illustrate that. 550 plus the 297? Yes, 550 cars and plus 200 bikes. Bikes, yep. Yeah. So the, the revised program takes uh, the building and the mass from the 14 story on the north side of the building and brings it down to a 10 story building off the average grade. Uh, this illustration is a cross section from north to south which be better illustrates the number of floors, number of stories, uh, and the mass as compared to the prior project. So in gray and this red dotted outline, we'll show you the, the bulk and the height of the prior project. That's uh, the north side, this is on the south side, which was the office, office building with the mechanical space on top, mechanical space on top. And this is roughly 52 feet of height reduction to average grade 122 feet to the top roof of the occupied floor. You can see the embedded parking structure on four levels connecting uh, north to south. And this is the, the current plan in section. Uh, on both north and south buildings, the, the highest level um, is for residential amenity space, and this is for a public observation deck, uh, restaurant uh, accessible uh, by the public, um, and on top of that, we do have a mechanical level. We have a full level of basement parking, which we'll show you in plan. We've, we actually will be going through the plans of each level of this building. And here you can see Cherry Street and Bank Street. Uh, this color is the retail space fronting the, the street, streets. So we're gonna walk through the major levels of this, this structure, uh, starting with the basement. We have uh, 208 parking stalls uh, below grade which are accessed via the residential lobby, uh, the hotel lobby, a public access lobby off the new St. Paul, and then a, a service freight elevator and stair. This square here is the uh, footings and foundations of 100 Bank. As we go up, you saw the street grid plan and the relative shapes of the, of the buildings above, but this is actually a cross section at, at grade to really show you the, the programming of the retail space and the entranceways. 
So as Kevin pointed out, we have a garage entrance off the New Pine, which is next to a residential uh, service dock, and the entrance off St. Paul, which is relatively flat. Before, we had very long, lengthy and steep uh, on and off ramps into the garage, so we've eliminated those. Hotel lobby is off St. Paul, uh, surrounded by retail, so all of the street frontage is retail. And then we maintain the loading dock to the south side, uh, primarily for retail and hotel use. The uh, long-term bike storage is, is with showers is located here and accessed off the street in the, in the garage. And this is a fire command center and service center. Moving up through the parking structure, uh, this is the uh, third level of parking. And the fourth level of parking is where you start to see the upper levels of the north and, and south building. On the north side, the first uh, three levels of housing is a little bit wider with the bay windows. Has a roof terrace, a parking deck, which is actually covered. You'll see on the next slide. And on the south building, we have an entire level of uh, amenity spaces off a roof terrace. And that's where you'll see the 3,000 square foot community space. And that uh, will be programmed as the city needs in concert with how the hotel would use the surrounding uh, amenity space. Moving on up, the, uh, you start to see the covered parking area in this shaded zone and our green roof or our stormwater collection zones, which are both over the parking along the front of the step back. This is a, this is a required step back for the hotel. And I'll, over here you can see the actual section that we went through before and there'll be a marker showing what level that we're looking at with the plans. The next series of floors, levels four through eight, uh, are both hotel to the south and residential to the north. You can see the step back of the building mass with roof terraces that are accessible by the units around the street facade. Uh, the core, the center core lobby area with elevators and then the service elevator to get to the loading dock and recycling uh, compost and trash. Hotel on the south. And we're gonna jump right up to the higher, highest occupied level which is on the north building comprised of amenities for the residences, uh, fitness, lounge, uh, group work, uh, play areas, dog wash that access a roof terrace and are adjacent to a, another green roof collection zone for stormwater. And we have mechanical space on the same level on both sides. So you can see that the, the 10 story building is actually to the last occupied level uh, and the mechanical is adjacent to that. And that's a little different from the south building where we have an additional unoccupied level for mechanical space uh, above the restaurant, kitchen, public observation deck, and there's some meeting rooms up here. And so the public via this core has access to the observation deck and the restaurant. So we really want to take advantage of the height and the roofs for solar. So we have uh, PV arrays of oh, about 18,000 square feet. 
uh, capping the project. And this uh, is the mechanical level unoccupied uh, with its own PV array on top of that. So that ends the, the planning plan sequence. Uh, we'll move into the series of, of renderings that you have, some of you have seen before. There are quite a few new faces in the audience. So um, I'll walk you through. Uh, this is the rendering that you saw at the opening of the presentation. Uh, the new St. Paul, L.L. Bean, exists on the corner. The Cherry Street access and the, uh, you can get a glimpse of the hotel in the background. Reversing your direction, looking uh, east and south, you start to see the new, new pine, the corner of the existing 67 Cherry Building, repurposed for office and retail. Uh, the, you can start to get a glimpse of the park, parking garage entrance, the residential loading dock, retail wrapping the corner, and moving down along uh, Cherry Street to the east. So this is the first three levels of residential, followed by the top five levels, step back on the mass, and then the amenities stepping back on top. <coughs> The new Pine Street looking down towards 100 Bank. And people asked before, well, how do you go under 100 Bank? We're not exactly going below grade under. We're actually going under the uh, opening of the upper levels of 100 Bank. And you can see that right down here. So this is a, a sloping street, which will go underneath the higher portions of 100 Bank. The north building is a brick in nature with, uh, with uh, storefront glass uh, and the main feature are the, the bay windows uh, to break up vertically the facade. New St. Paul to get you a glimpse of how you enter the parking structure, which is between the, the hotel uh, the south block and the north block. Again, the retail wraps all the way down the new St. Paul. This is the public entrance to the parking structure and the different levels of the parking structure. Moving to the south building, uh, we're changing the materials, the massing, uh, it still has a required step back at this level. So this is the community space approximately here, the 3,000 square feet, which is part of the second level of the, um, uh, of the south building, which is the amenities to the hotel, workout center, conference, uh, conference room. There will be access to uh, warming kitchens to, to service the community space and the hotel functions. Uh, the lower level is retail, flanking the hotel lobby. So this corner could be a, a restaurant, um, could be retail, more, sorry, excuse me, uh, more retail running down Bank Street to the south loading dock and the mass of 100 Bank. On this uh, facade, we're looking at uh, a dare limestone for the, the base of the building and a sintered stone uh, matching the adair for the, the body of the building. This is the um, top floor observation deck with the corner opening up for views of, of the lake, Adirondacks, partially covered and then the mechanical level on top. This again is, is a 10 story building from average grade to the last occupied roof of the floor with the penthouse on top. 
a little closer in view of, of how this uh, corner could look. The uh, Great Streets uh, will be really developed further. Um, this is really an architectural rendering to show off our wonderful building, not necessarily the landscape, so we'll, we'll get there in the next round of renderings when we start to coordinate the city's civil engineer with, with Kevin's firm. Um, this is a pretty good illustration, though, of how we, we would use the, the curb to the retail to the face of the building. So just to, to recap and wind up, um, the uh, public benefits that we talked about a month ago still remain the same. And uh, really it's all about downtown housing and including affordable units. And since we've increased the number of units, that increases the, the percentage of affordable. We are still reconnecting the two public streets to restore the street grid. Sustainable design is at the forefront of, of everything that we're designing, uh, including the LEED Gold certification, uh, the green roof areas and solar PV, and that helps us with the stormwater treatment. It's 100% treatment for the site. Community access, again, is, is a discussion and part of the project, uh, the community meeting space, the observation deck, and bike parking. Uh, and then the change from the office to hotel uh, helps uh, change the, the meals and tax revenues. We did not drill down deep into the schedule last time, so these two slides will give you a better feeling for where we are, where we're headed, and what it's going to take to get there. Um, this first slide is a month by month close in view from, from now through where we hope to break ground, which is middle to end of August. It's all contingent on the permit process and the flow of the permit process. So this first block is the Burlington Planning and Zoning step, of which uh, we are planning on submitting the end of February, beginning of March, to trigger a DAB session, March 24th, and the Development Review Board on April uh, 23rd. And that is another opportunity for public to come and, uh, and ask questions. So that review and approval is approximately two to three months in length. The next step, which is new to this project, because uh, we're amending the permit here, but since we changed the use, from commercial office on the south side, we've changed it to hotel that has triggered the Act 250 process. So we have already begun um, our letter writing and narratives to get the Act 250 submitted roughly the beginning of May, but first we need to secure allocations and renew some prior permits for water, wastewater uh, from the agency and natural resources at the state level. So we have both the state process moving along and the city process moving along. And at this point, we'll have enough information collected and assigned so that we can package the full Act 250 submittal, which will trigger a downtown review, which is an expedited Act 250 review. So it's a little different than a project outside of a downtown. And our expectation is two and a half months uh, we should have secured our Act 250 approvals. A couple other elements of this schedule. Uh, currently, there is a, a development agreement with the City of Burlington that has revisions due to the redesign and the nature of the redesign. Uh, those are being drafted and, and going back and forth. Uh, our plan is to have those resolved and approved and in line with the City of Burlington planning process by the time we get to the DRB. And then as everyone is aware, there is a settlement agreement uh, in process, and our hope is to get that resolved in the same timeline as the development agreement, so that there's alignment between the DRB and these pieces of the, the uh, process. We're not done yet. Once we get the permitting, we have to move on into uh, Department of Public Works for construction 
uh, permits. We have to align the Great Street programs with the city engineer and uh, our engineer, engineering ventures, and get uh, what was required to break ground. And so we've allowed about a two month uh, process to do that uh, so that everything will come together for sometime mid August. We need time to mobilize for construction and uh, that will happen in August, September. Bigger picture schedule, because everybody wants to know when are we gonna get in this building, when are we gonna get the new streets? Uh, this will show you where we move from 2020, right? We're through the, the first couple of quarters here pretty quickly. So here's the construction mobilization, the third quarter of 2020. Hopefully we're in the ground, moving things around, working foundation site. And then from this point forward, major construction begins for the residential podium and the north side of the building. We're gonna move from north side to south side and everything will be constructed in this path. So this block represents about an 18 month path to get the north, um, in phase one, these, these are certificates of occupancy points. So this is actually when parts of the building can be turned over and opened and used. So while this is going on, phase two is still being constructed, but there'll be another couple of quarters, another six months to finish off the, the upper floors of the residential, uh, get the mechanical system fully running, finish off the garage, which gets you to 20, the fourth quarter of 2022. Then we finish off the hotel and retail on the south side. It's, it's still being constructed, but this is where we're going to get our certificate of occupancy for those, those floors. And then to finish off the south side, we need another quarter, three months, which is really the winter of 2021 to finish off TCO number four, which is the hotel and get the streets, both of the new streets, uh, fully up and operating so that the project construction completion, we're anticipating, if all goes well, the second quarter of 2023. So that gives you kind of a little, little flow chart of how we're going to get from permitting to the second quarter of 2023 to completion. So that pretty much wraps up our part of the presentation and with these uh, four vignettes of what you've seen in the rendering. So we'd really like to open it up to questions and uh, hear your thoughts. And please step up to the mic. Hi, I'm Greg Eplerwood. Um, I'm sorry, you guys didn't introduce yourself, so I assume that you're both Brookfield and engineering. Venture reps? Uh, oh, we, we can do that right now. I'm, I'm Jesse Beck, architect with Freeman French Freeman. Okay. Thanks. Kevin Warden with Engineering Ventures here in Burlington. I'm on in Olson. I'm with Brookfield. Okay, thanks. <laughs> My name is Anin Olson, A A N E N O L S E N, and I'm with Brookfield. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, I have, uh, I guess, four questions. I'll just rattle them off. Okay. Four questions? Yeah, really fast. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, vertical and the uh, footprint uh, diagrams, there was this gray area in the area uh, labeled over the parking area. Uh, I'd like to know what that is. I couldn't read the label there. Secondly, the mechanical above the um, apartments. Um, what are you doing to isolate noise and so on from the, you know, the ceilings of those units? Um, I assume, I guess Brookfield will own the hotel and then it will be, uh, does Brookfield um, now uh, engage companies to, to manage the hotel? I'd like to hear about that. And then also, when will the streets be opened to uh, pedestrians and traffic? Thanks. Sure. Sure. Yeah, we'll we'll go through the the 
architecture a bit here. Uh, streets was that uh, second quarter of 2023 on the schedule chart. Um, also, all, all this will be posted on, on the CETO website so you can study and, and uh, drill down a little bit more yourselves as, as you go through the plans and, and the elevations and the schedule. But uh, yeah, the streets will be open to the public that second quarter of 2023. The, uh, the mechanical space, uh, we, we do have important uh, sound transmission <coughs> classifications that we have to stick to for sound moving from floors vertically and through walls horizontally. So we're, we're very in tune with uh, making sure the proper insulation and isolation of that mechanical equipment occurs. Uh, these mechanical spaces are above uh, apartment buildings all the time, but you do have to take care to isolate that. The mechanical equipment will have walls fully around all four sides uh, with louver systems and baffles so that uh, uh, sound will not be an issue. We do have a sound report, which will be part of our planning and zoning submittal uh, done by engineers who are specialists in, in sound and buildings of this type to show that there is no uh, impact of that equipment. Gray area. Um, gray area. Is that underneath? No, in the middle there above the parking, the east wing beyond, is that just a, a silhouette of a far of another building? Yeah, this, this is the wing because the, 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 uh, the apartment building is really a, a U shape, an unequal U. So this, this is the wing of the apartments in the background. Hotel ownership. So, so the, the hotel will be managed by a third party. There are a number of groups um, interested in, in that operation and frankly, they're very good at it, these, these third party operators. This is their business and they know it well and they're the best suited to do this, including a, an outfit based right here in Burlington. Hi, Frank Lopalino, City Councilor. Um, my question was, and may, maybe I didn't catch it, but about the Macy's building, can you give us an update what the timeline was? So for me, when I was looking at this project earlier on, two of the biggest considerations were the reopening of the streets to ease traffic congestion and parking. Um, f and I think 2023 is far too late, and if there's anything that can be done as we're moving forward, I think that's huge um, to be able to reopen. It would just change the way we move around downtown in such a significant way. Um, but the, the Macy's building was also one of the th selling points that I felt was going to be the first project that was going to start moving forward since there was a tenant that had requirements. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, the, the Macy's while we're not here specifically to talk about it today, uh, the Macy's redevelopment is operating on a separate track that will likely be much faster than this. Um, this it, it doesn't require as many um, state and local approvals as, as this project does. So um, we will be back to talk about that specifically and, and, and its schedule. Yeah, just to add on to 67 Cherry, it's, it's really a repurposing of an existing building using both of the existing levels. And that um, is an internal staff review at the, at the city level, so that shortens the length of time that we can get uh, into the construction period. So yes, we are anticipating a, a faster timeline for that, that project. Hi, um, ooh, well, hi. Um, good enough though. Um, one of my concerns looking at the, uh, the storefronts and the streetscape is I'm wondering how wide the sidewalks are and if there is room to, um, for, for outside cafes, for, I see you have a coffee, a proposed coffee shop, is there gonna be room for outdoor seating? Um, I think one of the real issues on Cherry Street and Bank Street and one of the frustrations and um, challenges for businesses on those streets has been activating 
the streetscape and getting people down there. And that was the whole idea of the proposed DID last year. That was one of the ideas. And I don't see a lot of like space for that, but I'm wondering if it's there and it's just not being shown. Yeah, and, and, and also how, if you did have the numbers of how wide the sidewalks are. Sure. Thanks for that question. Um, the, the, the sidewalks on Cher, on St. Saint, Saint Paul and Pine Street, again, new streets recovered uh, from when they're lost during the urban renewal, will be from the curb to the building 16 feet or more. Um, and that includes the sidewalk, it includes a tree and furnishings um, strip. The tree and furnishing strip is about six to eight feet wide. Um, and um, the other area, you know, Bank and Cherry Street are within the city right of ways, and those redevelopments, much like St. Paul down the street, will be done by the city separate from this project, but coordinated with the project. So I can speak briefly to it. From my experience, Bank Street, for example, the city's looking at having a streetscape with no curb. It'll be a flush curb. Um, and again, m plenty of room for activity between that flush curb and the building face. And I think one of the real opportunities is at the southeast corner of the building where St. Paul and Bank Street meet. I mentioned St. Paul is angled to align with the existing St. Paul. And that provides uh, two, two, two areas of interest. On the west side, it's a big triangular area with upwards of 25 feet um, or more from the curb to the building. So that could be uh, an area where um, some of the things you're talking about could occur. And across the street from that, there'll be kind of a small little um, parklet uh, next to the NBT bank there um, that's existing. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity. Um, benches, bike racks, trees, permeable pavers and, um, and, and cafe seating if the tenancy uh, design, you know, necessitates that. I'm sorry, just to, um, on Bank Street, the south, um, what is the width of that s sidewalk or that between, between the curb and the yeah, building? Once again, I, I do want to defer to the city uh, who's designing that section and it's subject to change. So. Just to describe the process. So it could be wider if we cut into Bank Street, you're saying? Uh, if the city decides to, it's to, much to wider get. Than, it's much wider than what was there before, if you remember walking down Bank Street. Right, which, you know, which didn't work for businesses. Right. Well, there were no, uh, on the north side of Bank right. Street, there were no businesses. We right. had a kind of blank, blank wall of an old mall. With well, there were businesses. So there was William Sonoma, um, J. Crew, like all of those Absolutely. businesses, you, just, had, but, they uh, didn't, but they didn't face because there wasn't really space for them to, yeah. to, to really activate the streets. Exactly. Yeah, they had uh, window dressings, and they were designed to be accessed from within the mall. So the new, right. the, the new uh, building will be designed to face the street. It'll be at least 15 feet um, from that flush curb I mentioned, and um, and I, so I, yeah, there there will be much more feet. pedestrian activity there. Okay, cool. Thanks. Hi guys, thanks for coming. I have three questions. Uh, we we know that Brookfield's here, but uh, do we have representatives from Don Sinek's office as well? And what role is Sinek still involved in this project, either active ownership? Uh, can someone answer that for me? Uh, yes, there is a representative from Devonwood here, and Devonwood remains a partner in the project. At 49%? I can't comment on structure. You know, Why not? Structure. You should be able to comment on structure. I mean, that's what we're here for. We want to be open and transparent about it, and we should be. I think that's unfortunate, and I think going forward, I think that's a big hurdle for you guys is confidence in this project. So I would urge you to be... Uh, open and transparent about who's involved in the project. Uh, secondly, not a big thing, but I noticed, did, was there 579 parking spaces the last time, or was it 550? And the reason I ask that, because I still don't get the math for the parking, because it doesn't seem like there's even close to being enough if you add everything up with retail, hotel, apartments. I mean, I, I, so. I can address that for you. The, the prior project 
which was over a million square feet, had about 761 stalls. This project has 550 spaces. And in real general terms, that equates to a 25% reduction in square footage, about a 25% reduction in parking. At the same time, you look at both planning and zoning formulas for what is required for these occupancies to come up with a count. And we look at the market. What does the market drivers to have the number of spaces that you need to sell your building or lease your building or whatever? So we are, by planning and zoning purposes, we're over 180 stalls higher with what we're building. So through planning and zoning formulas for housing, for hotel, there's zero requirement for retail. We, Office we have plenty of parking to meet the planning and zoning formulas, in addition okay. to putting over 200 in the basement out of the way. And my last question is concerning the uh, private public access to this project. At the end of the day, this project is in the heart of the old north end of Burlington. It's our community, it's our downtown, and I get concerned when I hear private, you know, public access and who will control that? And will we feel like we can go in and out and to the, to the towers, to the restaurants? I mean, who's going to be overseeing that? Because I think that's huge here in Burlington that we make sure that the public here and the locals and, and particularly the old North End um, has access to their downtown and I'm concerned about that. So I'd be curious about who's gonna control that. Community space is currently embedded in the, the hotel component, so it will be up to the hotel operator to, uh, to control that. And the truth is they're, they're the best at it as well. They, they do this all the time. If you've been to a contemporary hotel in, in almost any city, the, these amenities and the, and the restaurants have moved to the roof and they've moved to um, They've moved to other floors within the building. There are ways to secure the, the occupied floors and the, uh, the, the floors with rooms um, away from the public. There are dedicated elevators. So they're really the best uh, person to occupy this. And it, it, a hotel by its nature is a semi-public building anyway, much less than a contemporary office building, which is um, very restrictive on who can get in and out. And, and even a residential building is very restrictive in, in, the, in the times we live in. Um, a hotel actually offers the, the kind of the best permeability to, uh, to the public. This is really high. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, Karen Paul, city councilor. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. The first is I, I'm, perhaps maybe I misunderstood, but I did think that at the last meeting that you had about a month ago, that you had said that you would be coming forward with um, schematics on uh, the former Macy's building at the next meeting. And so uh, maybe I misunderstood, but uh, I understand from the answer to uh, Councilor Polino's question that that wasn't your plan to do that today. When is, do you, do you have a, a timeline on when you're going to be bringing that forward to the community? Um, <clears throat> we don't. We're still working on details of our anchor tenant. Um, we've re-engaged formally with, with that entity, and uh, as soon as there is some news or some confidence, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring it forward. Okay. Um, the other thing is there's... Uh, yeah, add to that, we, we did talk about uh, appearing at the NPAs, and we were trying to get scheduled for, uh, I think it was uh, April, and the agenda's full, so then we're going to try for Mar uh, May. So our plan is to appear at the NPAs for 67 Cherry at the appropriate time. Okay. Um, well, I can't speak for the ward... 2-3 NPA, but there are people that are here or, that could, and I can't, wouldn't be surprised if they might make the accommodation well, to. We're, we're in communication with them, and, and we've tried. Okay. Um, the other thing also, um, the Church Street facade, there's obviously a, a fair amount of excitement about what that's going to look like. When do you think you'd be coming forward with that? Yeah, I mean, there's... 
no real timeline for that. We're trying to get through the kind of over the biggest hurdles. Um, that's the fun part of the project. Okay. Um, and then two other things. The first is I did hear from a number of constituents who were uh, disappointed that uh, the meeting today, there's only one of them, and that the meeting is only at noon, which is, uh, represents a significant hurdle for many people who cannot be here in the middle of a work day. And at the last meeting that you had, you did have a meeting at noon, and then you had one in the evening. Um, I don't know what the reason was that you didn't have one this evening, but would encourage you, if you want to speak to it, I would be interested in hearing what your, what your plan is, but that there are a number of people who reached out to me and felt that you weren't really fully engaging the community if you're having a meeting in the middle of a work day when many people can't be here. I, I cannot speak to the reason why. It may have been a scheduling issue. It may have been, a, there may be a conflict with the room. I, I cannot, I, I don't know. Well, the meeting is yours, so. Yeah, it, it's really, we had the biggest turnout at lunchtime last time, so we figured that this would be a good time to hold the meeting. And there's gonna be subsequent meetings through the whole process of planning and zoning. So we also brought handouts, so I didn't mention that earlier. Over on the table, there's handouts. Uh, showing you uh, pieces, the important pieces of this presentation with the data and the information. And we are gonna be posting this uh, show on the CETO website for everyone's access at any time they want. And I think we have public access TV and the stations here. So uh, we have one meeting today and that's always scheduled. Okay, well, I, I, having been at both of the meetings l at the last time, there were people in the evening, and the people that were here in the evening primarily were not people that were here at noon. So just mentioning that, that there were a number of people who reached out to me who were disappointed that they could not be at the meeting in person. Um, and then the last question I have is just simply, you had mentioned briefly about the uh, lawsuit that you have um, with various appellants, and I'm wondering, you had said that you were uh, in the process of coming to resolution with that and wondered if there was anything else you could add to that. I cannot comment on active litigation. But what you said in January versus what you're saying now is different. Is there a reason to believe that there is progress being made? I cannot comment on active okay. litigation. All right, thanks very much. Hi, I'm Maxine Holmes. I've lived for 50 years in the old North End, and I'm very happy that you're here and willing to put something in the middle of Burlington that might be of um, use to all of us. and. I'm wondering what this project has for me personally as a resident living within four blocks of this building. And I'm very concerned about the fact that we have half of our years pretty awful weather, you know, winter, um, rainy, very cold in the late fall, early spring. Um, it was nice to have a mall to go walk inside and get our exercise, see the shops, meet people, socialize. And it was a very welcome place to be. I'm wondering what part of this complex is going to be a welcoming place to be for me and my friends and my uh, neighbors and the people that live in the old North End and the surrounding area and Burlington in general. And, uh, where can I go to get away from the weather? Like I have to go, it looks like I have to go from shop to shop. If I'm shopping, I have to go outside, inside, outside. You can't just take your coat off, leave it somewhere, like in your car, and walk around like you can at the mall in South Burlington. Um, it doesn't look like it's a welcoming place weather-wise. Is there an awning or some kind of a projection over the walkways around the building so that the ice and snow don't fall on our heads or, or keep us sheltered from the weather? Just a question. <laughs> um, that would be nice to have. 
The other thing is um, access to the roof. I know that the view from that roof is the most beautiful view in this part of the world. It absolutely is. It could be a big money maker and draw for the whole New England area. You can see the mountains to the, to the east. You can see almost to St. Albans to the north. You see right across to the Adirondacks and to the west. And to the south, you see Mount Philo and way down almost to Lake George. I know that I get excited about seeing these things on a regular basis. And I would be very excited if I could, oh dear, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting excited. <laughs> uh, if I had a place where I could come within walking distance and go right up to the roof and really enjoy being here, scenery-wise. And then have shops to go to, fine. Also have maybe a little restaurant, maybe a place where I can have coffee and a croissant, whatever. Um, how big is that place on the roof? I didn't see. Is there a bird's eye view of the rooftop? Uh, no bird's eye view. Can you tell me what's up on the roof? Sure. Sure. We, we have a plan. Uh, and maybe it'll help. Let's get it up. Let's get it up. Um, so th this restaurant, so if you're comfortable walking into a lobby or an open hotel lobby, Oh, they're, they're fine, yeah. <laughs> then you have access to elevators, which will bring you right up the 10 levels uh -huh. and bring you out right here. OK. And you can choose to have a restaurant experience, or you can choose to go directly out. Now, the restaurants, do they have windows going in that look out in all the directions, or? It's all windowed restaurant. OK. You do have a roof overhang so that in inclement weather, there's protection for outdoor seating. And this restaurant is quite large. It'll seat 150 people. Okay. Inside. Okay. With, now, with another, you know, 70, 80 people outside seating. So that's quite large, that green area. Yes. Okay. And maybe it'll be green with maybe potted plants, uh, <laughs> bushes, trees, that's, grass. You know, once we get through permitting, we can get rid yeah, of those details. Yeah. And, and I'm envisioning help. a place like the uh, La Samaritaine. A department store in Paris where you could go, you have a dedicated elevator that takes you right to the top, free, and you can wander around, there's pathways, there's trees, there's, you see the city in every direction, it's wonderful. <clears throat> How about that other uh, building, does it have a rooftop with uh, greenery? It, it does have a rooftop with greenery, but again, that's a residential building, which uh -huh. is worried about security, safety for the tenants, so that will be accessible as if you're a guest of a tenant, and for the tenants to, to use this secure lobby down below and use these elevators to, um, to bring you up to, through the amenity space to this roof terrace. You can see the size of, of this roof terrace is, is It's much larger. As large. This, this stretches out and around the whole building. So right. you have to visualize someone who doesn't want to spend money on coffee or croissants can come out here and enjoy the view without... Um, is there a way that the public could have access to the roof of the other building? Maybe by belonging to a club membership thing, some kind of a deposit of sorts on a monthly, yearly basis, uh, a place where you can go and feel secure and have this wonderful view. for anyone that's willing to participate. It just, uh, I think that, that that is a huge area. I would like to have access to it. Also, that faces north, right? Correct, yep. Okay. Then west. And north and? This, this yeah. west. West. So you have a view over the lake and a view to the north. You, do you have a view to the south? Well, you have a, a mechanical building here. Uh huh. But yeah, you, you've got a, some view to the south. Okay. And how about the east, <clears throat> towards Mansfield, etc.? Uh, well, yeah, building a building blocking. The so there's no part of the roof that views to the east. There's Correct. This, this uh, small stretch over here faces. 
Okay, okay, okay. Okay, well, I, I have two concerns. One is I think that it would be wonderful, absolutely wonderful, to have access to this other roof. If you can make it happen, please. Also, I think it would be wonderful to have a little bit of access to the view to the north, uh, to the east. Uh, I'm concerned about green space in Burlington. We cut a lot of trees down in the last year or two for, for projects such as this, apartment buildings, condos. There's a lot of trees that went down, mature trees. We need green space. We need to be able to breathe in this city. And I think that it would be nice to have as much green space as possible with plants, grass, whatever. I'm sure the Parks Department would be happy to help <laughs> keep it up. Um, so whatever you can do to help me and my friends, my neighbors, people who live here, and friends that are coming to visit, tourists, really enjoy the top of the, what are you going to call it? What is the name of this building? It has no name. Pardon? It has no name yet. So the top of the no name, <laughs> whatever. The top of the, I think that would be great. It'd be a good draw for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the, the, the comments that you just heard from the previous speaker are what you would have found at NPAs. If you had followed what we ask, which is to come to NPAs early and often and have that kind of informal conversation with people who live in the community about what we'd like to see come out of this, these buildings. The uh, NPAs are called the town meetings of Burlington because Burlington did away with town meetings. And so it's the opportunity for residents to come together. And there's a requirement that you come to the NPAs with a major impact project like this that impacts the whole city. It would require going to each of the NPAs as others have done. Their neighborhood planning associations. And um, you would have had the kind of conversation that we all just heard now. I want to mention that a lot of events in Burlington begin today with acknowledging that we are on unceded land of the Western Abenaki. The reason I mention that is because it tells you a lot about the ethos of Vermont and how people who live here, especially people that have lived here for a long time, like Maxine, I've only lived here 45 years, people who have been born and raised here, there's a feeling for the land that is that we have ownership in it, that we have a stake in it. Now, you own this, this property for this building, but we own all of the infrastructure that makes that building possible. We're the consumers, we're gonna be the shoppers, we're gonna eat in those restaurants, we're gonna build it. And I really think that failing to come early and often to the NPAs to talk to people about their feeling for this space, you've really missed an opportunity. Because if you had done that, and it's not too late, to get ideas from people, you might have been able to make this presentation and say, when we met with the people in 2-3 NPA, they told us that they don't have any community space, and we're providing it for you. You would be able to bring ownership of residents in the community into your presentation, which would make us feel more like partners with you in this project than we feel coming and having you tell us what you're going to do for our community. And as you heard from the last speaker, it's not so much for our community as it is for uh, the profits of the people who build the building. So I'd like you to take an example of, of a developer in our community like Eric Farrell, who when he builds a project, he goes to his NPAs early and often. And he identifies people that have any opposition to his project and he meets with them more often. And he finds ways to build bridges. He's done it very effectively you've got to get better at it, because we all want something to succeed here. You've really got to get better at engaging with the community.
I'm back. I wasn't um, planning on coming back, but um, myself and Ch Charlie Giannoni are members of the Ward 2, 3 NPA, and we've been on the emails with you. And I just wanted to um, um, confirm what Karen said in that we do have space in our agenda for both March and April. So um, we can accommodate you either or both of those months. Okay, that's good new news to hear. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, I just want to ask about a couple quick things, or three. Uh, one is, if I'm not mistaken, when the project started to show signs of life again, there was a commitment to restore the parking on the streets and the, and the walks, the sidewalks that had been taken away. And it seems like a few of those parking spaces have come back, but, but only, only a few, seven or eight or something like that. What's going on on that count? Through the questions, we okay, can so that's the first one. Next one is uh, financing seems to have been a problem, perhaps the central problem that created the hiatus in the project after the demolition had been completed. And I'm wondering if financing has been secured, if, uh, if the project is pre-approved for financing somewhere. And then finally, uh, the TIF issue. I know that the legislature has to authorize uh, or extend a deadline or something of that kind to uh, allow access to TIF funds that was anticipated uh, earlier in the project. And I'm not sh I wanted to see if you're still anticipating using TIF funds and how, how that's going to work and, and, and what uh, the sum uh, might look like with the modified scale of the project. Uh, for the first item, parking on the streets, I think I can answer that one. Yeah. Um, that was uh, coordinated last fall uh, with the DPW. The project still uh, obtains easements to use the north side of Bank Street and the south side of Cherry Street, but since there was no activity, uh, we worked closely with DPW to move the Jer Jersey barriers um, in return access where feasible. And what that resulted in was moving the, the, the barriers on the south side of Cherry all the way back to the curb. Uh, DPW chose to install a pedestrian way there rather than parking, which um, you'll see is out there now. And on the north side of Bank Street, in the west half towards 100 Bank, uh, about four or five parking spaces were returned. Um, the east side, uh, of, of the North Bank Street area. The excavations within the project to install sewer to maintain the existing mall. Um, there's a slope that leads right up to the backside of those barriers, so they were not able to be moved during that process. Okay, so, that, so that's as many spaces as you've been able to restore. There were 30 plus, I think, uh, that had been taken away, right? Uh, boy, I don't have the number. I think it was more like 11 to 12. Uh, there were several taken away on Cherry because the bus staging was moved uh, under a separate um, you know, agreement with the transit center. Um, so that is as many as we're able to return until the project has been constructed. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can just... Uh, yeah, I, I can talk about financing. I mean, there's not really n new news to report from a month ago. We're exploring every option um, of financing. It's a little premature to, to have a commitment in place for, without a, a GMP, without approvals. Okay. Um, so we are working through that. Everything's being explored. It's an opportunity zone. There, there are numbers of um, um, avenues for financing. Okay. And the, and the TIF, the TIF, yes, the, the TIF is kind of an integral part of the negotiation of the development agreement that Jesse alluded to earlier today. Um, so that is an ongoing issue. The, the plan is to use the TIF funds that are available from the, uh, the scale of the new project. If it's, if it's not all of what was available under the original scope, we would use what was available. And we, we think the, uh, the calculation works out right now where it will cover the costs um, of the, the new streets and any, any of the new infrastructure. And is there an impending deadline that Montpelier would need to address with TIF to allow uh, 
TIF funds uh, to be used? It with, is, with yeah, it's all kind of pending the negotiation of that development agreement. They, they essentially gave us an extension of the original deadline um, and to, to come back to them. So it's not all is lost. Okay, thank you. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I did grow up in the area. I remember fairly well the neighborhood that the original mall replaced, little frame buildings and so on. I remember the State Theater not far from this site. Um, I don't, frankly, have much context for malls or multi-use buildings of this size, with one exception. And uh, before I ask my question, let me just see if you're familiar with this as well. Have any of the three of you visited the Complex du Jardin, the garden complex in Montreal? Yeah? I'm glad, I'm, that's reassuring to me. Um, I think if you stop anybody on the street in Montreal who lives there and you ask if they're familiar with the Complex du Jardin, the answer you get is likely to uh, draw a picture of the public atrium. That's valuable to me when I'm in Montreal simply because it's a gathering place. It's a place where all sorts of different things can happen. Um, everything from musical performance to a fountain to um, really amazing kids um, programming during the holidays. It's a large public space. If I'm correct, the present plans call for a single 3,000 square foot function room, which is the closest I can come to that. Um, that seems to me to be perfectly adequate for a Rotary Club meeting or a meeting like this, but maybe not to provide the sort of public heart of the building that would function in the way that Church Street itself functions, a place to gather, meet people, get out of the weather, socialize, people watch at no cost. Here's my question. How much thinking uh, did the group planning this project uh, do to try and come up with a possibility for that, a place where a piano might go? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it all started with Plan BTV. Uh, this project has three, four years of, of history of uh, having public charrettes uh, in the old mall, uh, going to each NPA, I think twice we made it to each NPA, and collecting all those thoughts and ideas and sifting them down to what uh, the previous program was and the current program. So the, the opportunities were... Uh, synthesized through that development agreement uh, with the city councilor, the city of Burlington, and all that input to two prime activities or program spaces. One is a open public observation area, unrestricted, where you could have outdoor performances small. You could have a piano. Uh, it is partially undercover, so it's sort of, you know, not all season, but multi-season. Uh, the hotel lobby could act as some of that welcoming community space to come into the elevator bank and go up. Uh, the community space was very specific in the development agreement and the iterations that it is going to be designed further once we get beyond the, the permitting and, and the construction piece is that there would be a committee form to study how to use it, what's its best use, what should the configuration be other than a placeholder of 3,000 square feet. And it says specifically that it should be coordinated in its use so that um, not only the public has access, but the other occupants of this structure can use it as well and it be a scheduled type space. So. It, it still isn't totally defined as how that space is formed and what it, how it should be used. But that single 3,000 square foot space is what we're working with. Yes, for, for a controlled, enclosed space. Yep. And I, I would just add to that, um, 
to, to dial back six years when Plan TV, Plan B TV, someone showed some housing over the mall, which seemed, you know, far flung and farcical at that time. Um, and now we're here. And at that time when we'd had hundreds of, um, and I participated as a citizen and as a, uh, on the Plan B TV team, um, had hundreds of people providing input. There were a lot of other ideas like opening up St. Paul Street and Pine Street and, and here we are. So those are also portions of that private property that were once public but taken over that are being returned, uh, including some of the gathering areas we talked about a little earlier today. So there are, I think that's, um, those two streets are not quite an acre, um, but almost an acre uh, returning to, to public access and, and um, enlivening those portions of, of, uh, of the city that, that were, were not uh, at a prior time. So, thanks. Uh, I do appreciate the work you've all put in. I'd simply request you continue to think about large, enclosed, indoor public space, the sort of place you'd picture a fountain or a piano or a stage for children's performances, children's programming and so forth, and that if you haven't visited the Complex de Jardin, the garden complex in Montreal, to see what I'm talking about and how important that can be to a downtown, um, love to, well, heck, I'll, I'll drive. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, thanks for the uh, uh, sketch of the timelines, uh, which I requested last time, and uh, still looking forward to finding out what's going to happen as far as um, the office space is concerned. And, and does the promise of 750 new jobs, now you've had another month to think about it, does that still apply? I'm a, I'm a bit... Um, chagrined that the city is not here because the city was the, the salesperson on behalf of Sinex. Uh, and the, it's the city that made the promises to the electorate. And I'm a little bit chagrined that there's no one from the city to um, answer for themselves. Um, so I don't want to ask too many rhetorical questions, but there was the, the comment about um, from Mr. Brookfield here, uh, that you were going to be um, speaking to your anchor tenant as far as um, office space is concerned. Uh, is that the same anchor tenant that um, just lost uh, $10 million again in budget deficit in the last quarter and $40 million in the previous quarter, or the previous year rather, and is um, projected to pay over the odds for office space downtown. Is that the same one? I, I don't know who you're specifically talking about, but I have a good guess, and I'd assume, yes, that's, that it's the same. Okay. Idea. All right, good. Now, the other thing I've, I'm, or I, I was active for about 20 years, as Kevin knows, on the Ward 1 NPA. I'm no longer on the steering committee, but I can assure you that uh, the steering committee um, that's in, currently in place would wipe the slate clean for you to come back. We wouldn't make two hours available on the schedule for you. So March the 12th, 7 o'clock at the hospital, you'd be very, very welcome. Um, so the other question that I have, Jesse, it was, it was good to see the public benefits, but I'd like to see two gap analyses, one being the public deficits. I'm not sure what the antonym is for benefits in this particular case, but what has the public lost compared with the old MAL, and what has the public lost compared with the bill of goods that we were sold um, 40 months ago, 45 months ago? I, I, I think you owe it to the people of Burlington who voted for this essentially in the first place. Otherwise, it makes it look as if it's just a Brookfield development and you've looted the public uh, aspects that were sold as being such an essential part of the, of the project and the public benefit. So uh, I'd really like you to wrap your arms around that and next time come up with those slides. That would be great. Thank you.
Uh, yeah, I just got a couple quick questions. Uh, I know you had outlined having 550 parking spaces and 297 bike spaces. Those are going to be dedicated for hotel guests and tenants, or is any of that public parking? So we have a, an obligation through planning and zoning to provide parking for the residents, mm -hmm. for the hotel, and for the other uses in the building that require parking. So the answer is a complex one. It, it's going to be a controlled parking management plan. And those spaces that are above and beyond and available, the public will have access to. And how many spaces is that? That's yet to be determined how many exact spaces that's going to be. OK. Um, second question, I know you'd laid out the 357 housing units, including 72 affordable units. Uh, just out of curiosity, you know, when you say affordable housing, what exactly do you mean? And by extension, what exactly are the other units going to be? Um, well, there, there's a, a formula that's required to, to set those rates. Uh, but the, the affordable will be sprinkled throughout and they will not look or feel any different from the other units. Same size, same configuration, same finishes. So you would not know whether you're in an affordable unit or not an affordable unit. And in order to get, but you, you mean when you say you wouldn't know from the perspective of living in it, but it would be qualifying for affordable housing to live there. And do you have a sense of what the market value of the other units would be? Not, not today. I mean, we're, we're talking about occupancy close to three years from now, so um, a lot can change in three years. So it's, it's hard to quote a rent today. But would the idea be to have them be market value housing or would they be yeah. sort of? Uh, yeah, the balance would be market rate. And there's a, like Jesse said, there's a very strict formula on the calculation of the rent of the affordable units in Burlington. Burlington's got a whole, it's, its own formula yes. um, that will prescribe it. But the other units could be subject to, you know, market value as an intangible factor calculated by the ownership. Is that just, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's market demand. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm just curious because I know housing is something that a lot of people are concerned about with Burlington and being affordable. Uh, so just interesting to hear what you have to say about that. Thank you. So I'm looking at the parking area do you know what the square footage of that white area that's between the u-shaped building and the hotel uh, i'd have to kind of guess at it but um, you're talking about the the space between the the two that's on top the roof of the garage top of the garage 50,000 square feet, roughly. How many? 50,000, roughly. 50. So wouldn't that be a space that could, could be used by the public in the ways that some of the previous speakers have been talking about? Well, we're actually using it for rainwater, stormwater collection zone. So there is a- The roof? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so that's, that's about half of that space is to collect stormwater and uh, bring it down to the filtration system. So um, that you would not want the public on that space. Okay, so that, that would leave 25,000 square feet, which is 10 times the community room. Um, still a lot of space. And couldn't that be used for all the things that were previously mentioned? And wouldn't you want to develop, to make that a public area for the, why wouldn't you want to do that? Well, it, it, there's a lot of logistics and challenges in, in doing that. It certainly could be done depending on cost and expense and access and safety, security, all the technical issues, yeah. Because the parking garage is accessible to the public anyway, it, and the roof isn't being used, why not? It seems no brainer. And particularly with, um, with the loss that people had with the mall and the, and the pointing to the complex Jardin in Montreal and all that, seems like you could do it if you want to. And I hope you will. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Paul Bushner. I'm a Burlington resident, and I've uh, owned and operated an amazing kettle corn stand on the Church Street Marketplace since 2003. Um, so I had a Marketplace commissioner approach me on Saturday when I was out at my cart and said that you have reopened the bathrooms in the um, Galleria space accessible from Church Street and uh, or are planning to do so they're open now. That's correct. So I wanted to thank you very much for that because there has been a huge demand for public restrooms and and um, so that that's a wonderful thing that you're doing for the community there and I encourage you just to keep that open. Uh, and relative to that space, obviously it's not part of the current proposal. We've had a lot of questions about the Macy's building, but um, and the original original plans had uh, significant changes to the Church Street portion of the original mall, and so uh, I was would, would be interested to hear your thoughts about potential future development in that space outside of just keeping the existing storefronts in connection to Macy's and whatever's left of the food court and those bathrooms open. So that's one question. And then a second question, we've had a lot of comment about parking and the parking space. And you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but the original proposal had parking on the third and the fourth levels, I believe, and it extended right out to the edge of the building. And it did look as though there was potential, none of us have a crystal ball about what transportation options will be in 25 years. But uh, it's actually, I'll, I'll preface my question with just a statement, it's actually my hope that you're overbuilding parking for the future needs and that some of the space that's, that's currently dedicated to parking might be deemed unnecessary in the future and could be repurposed. So back to the prior development project, it looked to me like there was opportunity to at least in the curtain area of that old parking design to reclaim that and use it as interior space not dedicated to parking. Is there any provisions in the future if we don't need all of this parking to be able to repurpose it by design or would that just be something that would have to happen you know, with a future permit. I think we're, we're all trying to guess what's going to happen with the amount of cars we actually need and to build for. And, and parking is extremely expensive to build in this kind of a project. Uh, so we're going through a balancing act right now of meeting what the city has adopted for planning and zoning ordinances and formulas. And there are reanalyzing that as we speak. So that's going through a whole new understanding and a prediction of what's going to happen in the future. So um, we feel that we've met what we think the market needs and balanced that with what planning and zoning requires and what others outside of this think through settlement agreements and lawsuits think that it should be more parking. So we're kind of threading the needle at this project being what we feel is appropriate. Can it be repurposed? Sure. Uh, you know, these are structures that are built to last a long, 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 long time. So parking decks can be repurposed. Uh, they're structurally sound enough to place public space on in the future. So sure, uh, that's part of the built-in plan is the changing nature of something like parking. But there, yeah. Yeah, and I was just going to add, thanks for your comments, the, the first part of your comment we haven't talked much about, but the existing mall that's there now will open out onto the new St. Paul, and it'll open out at a crosswalk that's right next to the door that Jesse pointed out, which leads to that parking area. So why well, I'm not able to share or not aware of any other changes to that, that space, that's what this will result in, is a, a walk through from Church Street through that existing mall and then entering out onto the new St. Paul at a crosswalk at mid-block. Yeah, thanks for that comment, because I don't think a lot of people have been thinking about that, and that's another way of improving flow. That's a pedestrian flow issue, not a traffic flow issue, but. Thank you. Thank you. 
And any, anything about other things about developing that space? Well, like I said earlier, it's, um, it represents a, a great opportunity. It's just we're, we're trying to get through the, the higher hurdles, over the higher hurdles at this point. Um, and um, it's, we, like I said, we have an opportunity. Um, what, you get, what you've created on Church Street is irreplaceable, and um, we look forward to being a, you know, a good neighbor. Great. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jeff Fucci and a downtown merchant, um, long time and currently with Simon Pierce. Um, I know you've heard a lot about parking and, uh, and I sort of understand the formula um, really comes from the city and not necessarily even f from uh, the developer. Um, one of my questions though is, is how is this parking actually owned and controlled? Will the housing units actually own a parking unit or just have access to it and will the hotel also have ownership of parking. Um, just curious as to how that works, because it seems like you've added more housing units and reduced parking, if I understood you correctly, that the, the project is more housing at this point, but you were able to reduce the amount of parking spaces. Um, that was due to eliminating the office space too, so. Right. There, there's a one-to-one -one ratio for spaces to housing and that we uh, currently accommodate in the garage. So we haven't reduced the parking to r ratio to residential. To, to, to residents. Um, and ha so about the ownership of it. And then also about the sizing of the housing units. Like what is the anticipated, um, will there be a variety of square footage sizes, an average, um, you know, whether it'll be a lot of one bedroom type of housing, uh, larger housing for families, um, that type of. So, so the parking will be managed. There'll be uh, gates and act controlled access. And yes, the hotel residentials will have sort of their, their, they'll be leasing spaces. They won't be buying and owning spaces. They're not condominiumizing the parking. So they'll have access and use as to their, their needs. Um, the housing units, we have both studios, singles, and doubles. Uh, the average sizes are about 500 to 550 for studios, uh, 820 for singles, one bedrooms, and 1140 for uh, two bedroom units. Thank you. I've already asked my questions, but I had somebody who texted me once, so I told them that I would ask this. Thank you again for being here and for answering everyone's questions. Um, the, I don't know if you have in the past addressed when the construction begins and there are businesses that are in the mall that will be displaced, um, how, what, what happens with that? What arrangements you have made um, with the people that you have as tenants currently in the mall. I mean, and even, even if it's not literally impacting them right outside their door, there is a, tr there is a significant impact. So if you could just speak to that, um, thanks. Well, I, I don't think, I mean, we're, if, you're, if you're talking about the, the middle block construction, it's not necessarily going to affect their day-to-day -day life. There, there's no access to that space today. The mall kind of just ends. Um, it, when we do get to the um, the interior of the mall and, and renovate that, there there are lots of ways to to accommodate tenants. We do mall renovations all the time. You can move them temporarily. You can um, you know it, there there are, you can work at night. There there are lots of ways to kind of work around an existing tenant. We do it all over the country. I think we've uh, come to the end of our hour and a half promise to get you back to work or whatever you need to do. Thank you very much for all your comments and uh, we take them and we'll think about them and uh, work them in the plans and we'll be back through the planning and zoning process uh, through the DAB and DRB fairly soon. So thank you very much.